So Christianity has a story, has the best story, has a story of men and women who are broken, who are sinful, who are created good, and the story of the God who loved them and redeemed them. And that story has gone on for 2,000 years. We've been telling that story for a long, long time. It's a great story. The Reformation, we're going to see tonight, we're going to talk about how the Reformation fundamentally shifted the stories the world told. So every culture, like I said, every culture has stories. Uh, ancient Greece, right, if you read Homer, Homer has wonderful stories, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And I always laugh because our kids read that here at Lourdes. And when I first came to Lourdes three years ago, my eighth graders were reading the Iliad, and I was like, so am I. <laughs> This is awesome. Are you ahead of me in the book? What happens in chapter 10? But it's a great story because in, in Greece, again, you could tell people, hey, it's a great thing to have courage. You should have courage as a young person. But if you read the Iliad, you encounter characters like uh, Hector, who sacrifices his life for the good of his city and his family. Or you could tell people, you know, it's really bad to be uh, kind of consumed by rage and vengeance. You could say that. But Homer tells a story, and he tells a story about Achilles, whose rage and bitterness and jealousy causes mass destruction. And it's much more impactful. Stories matter. So, there's three big stories that are happening in our time and that got us to where we are. And those stories are being told in our culture, in the media, uh, in the way people talk in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods. So you know the Christian story. The second story is the Enlightenment story. The Enlightenment story, if you don't go to Lourdes, you, you might not have heard of the Enlightenment. We talk about it sometimes here. The Enlightenment is an 18th century philosophical, cultural, ac or, um, architectural movement. Uh, and we're going to get to how it got there in a second. But the story the Enlightenment tells is that reason is really what saves mankind. And here's why. Let's just go there now. Here's what happened. And here's the problem that we want to address tonight, brothers and sisters. For 1,500 years... Western civilization had one story. I mean, there's this Christian story, and it informed culture. It, it informed public policy. It shaped the lives, the minds, the hearts of young people for that long. And what happened in the Reformation is that story became fractured. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more at the end. In the Reformation there's a major challenge to that story. And what happens is, in 1517, Luther, he has two main challenges to the church. And to this day, Protestants have two main challenges that they differ on with Catholicism. The first one is they think that the Bible is the only authority. Bishops, popes, priests do not have authority. Tradition doesn't have authority. It's only the Bible. The second one was sola fide, that we're saved only by faith. That's the only thing that can save us. Not good works, not living a good life. That might be nice, but what really matters is faith. And those are the two pillars of the Reformation. And here's what happened. That started in 1517. And that's why we're doing this series. Brothers and sisters, within three years of that, you have a whole bunch of reformers people who were protesting against the Catholic Church, who were Christians. And here was the major problem. They all agreed that the Catholic Church was wrong. And they all said the Bible is what matters. What the Bible teaches is what we should all believe. The problem was that within three years of the start of the Reformation, none of them could agree with each other about what the Bible meant. Already, three years in. 
And so for the next hundred years or so, you're going to have Catholics and Protestants arguing and fighting with each other. But not just Catholics and Protestants, you have Protestants fighting with each other. Calvin and Luther and Zwingli and all their followers. They fight with each other about what does the Bible mean? You have massive wars that happen. You have the 30 years wars. You have lots of politics. Europe tears itself in half. And at the end of that time, we get the Enlightenment. You start moving into the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment says, these religious people, all they do is fight. Have you ever heard that before? Have you ever heard anyone say that religion is the cause of wars? Okay, I'm the only one. Okay, a bunch of you. All right, we all hear that. That's a major accusation. When you hear these modern atheists, they say all religion ever causes is war and fighting. And the Enlightenment comes along and it tells a different story. And that's part of the story it told. Is it said, Christianity is a, is a thing of superstition. And all it does is it creates fighting. And by the way, these Christians can't agree among themselves and there's no way to answer their questions. All right, Lutherans, after 100 years of fighting with Catholics, can't agree about what the Bible says. And Calvinists can't agree with Lutherans about what the Bible says and what it means. And so the Enlightenment comes around, and you have these thinkers, and they say, faith doesn't work. And there's this famous thing that starts to happen in the Enlightenment is they say, if you want to be a Christian, if you want to be a person of faith, that's fine. Just keep it to yourself. N.T. Wright says that as Catholics and Christians, we pray, he's not a Catholic, but as Christians, we pray, our Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Enlightenment put it backwards. And the Enlightenment said, God can have heaven as long as we get to kick him out of earth. So if you want to be a Christian, that's fine. But all Christians do is fight, and so we're not going to allow you to speak in the public square. And that argument is still around today. Religion is a private matter, not a public thing. And it's important for us as Christians to realize that's a new thing with the Enlightenment, with the 18th century Enlightenment. And it resulted as a direct result of the Reformation. We were fighting so much with each other that we couldn't get along. So the Reformation kind of gets rid of authority, right? Luther comes around and he says, there's no authority except the Bible. And as soon as he does that, you just get all this fighting. The Enlightenment says, well, let's go to reason, reason alone. And so you get this huge rational movement. You have the scientific revolution. And people think, we're going to go on and on and on, and we're going to get rid of disease and wars and poverty. The key word of the Enlightenment that was used over and over again by philosophers was the word progress. We still use that today in our political discourse. That's an Enlightenment key word, was progress. We're just going to get better and better and better. That's the story it told. So what goes on then? The Enlightenment continues, and really it's still alive and well with us today. When you meet people who talk about the facts, or they can only say, can you prove it to me? And they want scientific proof for everything, that's kind of an Enlightenment mindset. The problem with the world is people who don't think straight. But here's what happened. The Enlightenment, the big Achilles heel of the Enlightenment, was the problem of evil. The Enlightenment promised, it said, you know, and by the way, one, let's backtrack one second. Some of you have heard me say this. The greatest thing about the Enlightenment is that it named itself. And one of the, one of the biggest rules of the Ten Commandments is you can't give yourself a nickname. Right? You're not allowed to do that. So some of you know the story. My best friend growing up, Eric Schmidt, we're in college one day and he turned to me and he said, Larkin, I want you to call me Sweetness. And I was like, <laughs> I will never call you sweetness. <laughs> right, Walter Payton already has a nickname, and as I always say, Eric Schmidt, love him, but he is anything but sweetness. 
You can't give yourself your own nickname. The Enlightenment did. The Enlightenment, they thought we were the bringers of light and truth and freedom. So there had to be a time where there was darkness. And so the Christian ages, the ages of the Catholic Church, they called the Dark Ages. That's where that term comes from. No one knew it as that before. The Enlightenment put that name on it polemically. Okay. Then you get what's called postmodernism. And this is something that people are still reacting to today. It's, it's, it's alive and well today. It's a very prevalent thing in our culture. What is postmodernism? Postmodernism says that this whole thing about truth, there is no truth. There's my truth and your truth. And there's perspective. My favorite um, cultural, what was that? My favorite cultural example of postmodernism is the play Wicked. You have the traditional story of the Wicked Witch of the West, right? And in that story, what happens in the play Wicked in the modern world is they flipped it on its head. And they said, what if the Wicked Witch really was just misunderstood? There's no right or wrong, there's just perspective. And so the modern world said, we're going to fix all problems. We're going to overcome racism and wars and disease. And then we got Hitler and Stalin and Mussolini. And even today, we got 9-11, not that long ago. And the world says, this is a lie. The problem with the world is not just lack of knowledge. It's not that there's not enough technology. There's something deeper inside the human heart that's wrong. Something's broken. Christians call that sin. Postmodernism just says it's agendas. So postmodernism comes around and it says, all you modern people think you're so smart, all you're doing is putting your power on someone else. This is a lot already, I know. I want to just give three images that I think might help you understand these three kind of movements. So imagine buildings in Denver. The Catholic building would be soon Our Lady of Lords with this beautiful renovation. <laughs> it already is. But the cathedral, if you imagine the cathedral, if you've been to the cathedral downtown in Colfax, that's a Catholic building. It's beautiful. It speaks of God. It has a harmony and a unity to it. A modern building would be any skyscraper. Right? It just says we're going up and up and up, very straight, very clean lines. That's modernism. Postmodernism is our museum of art. <laughs> Has anybody been to our art museum? I can't tell you what shape it is because it does not have a shape. <laughs> That's postmodernism. Postmodernism says there's no one way. There's, let's make a new shape in 18 different directions. It's disorienting. That's postmodernism. It says anytime someone says to you, this is true, all they're doing is trying to put power moves on you. And if you don't think that's alive in our culture, I just challenge you to listen to talk radio or any political show. That'll come up every 30 seconds. That's postmodernism. A couple more things I just want to mention about this. And one, one more example that might help you kind of wrap your mind around this is that if you go to a university, if you went to a university like 50 years ago, you have core requirements. And one of the big core requirements every student would have to take was something called Western civilization. Everyone had to take that. You had to know the, the greater movements of the history of Western thought and culture and, and all the movements. Today, like I went to the University of Colorado, most Catholic university in the nation, <laughs> and the idea of Western civilization, that's a modern idea. It's also a Catholic idea. It's the idea there's a story. There's a story that embraces all of us. It's a big story. Postmodernism comes and it says, that is so oppressive. That's so oppressive. And that's favoring, it's bias. You're favoring one story when really there's a thousand different stories. 
and they, they don't complement each other. So when I went to CU, you could take Western civilization, but you could also take, say, like, thought of Polynesian poets between 1684 and 1776. That's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. But to put those on par is a very postmodern thing to do. Is to say that Western civilization is not special. There's no big story that embraces all of us. There's just a thousand different stories. Now here I want to bring it back to the Reformation. That's the world we live in today. People think this way. They think sometimes when we tell a story that's, that's too all-embracing, that's oppressive. But then you also have a lot of modern movements that say religion has no place in public discourse. And that goes back to the Enlightenment story about religion being the source of all wars. I watched um, Chris Hitchens you know, talking about this recently on YouTube. The religion is the source of all wars. What's interesting is if you, I think if you look at any period in history, you're going to find wars. Wars are a fact of human history, not Christianity. Okay, so back to Reformation. What does this mean for us? And here's where I would just want to challenge everybody tonight. The fragmentation of Christians destroys our story. Today, we live in a world where Christianity is going to be less and less popular. And the, one of the biggest factors about that, from an outsider looking in, what they say, right, and people do this with world religions too, right? Have you ever heard someone say, well, there's Buddhists and there's Hindus and, you know, there's Muslims and Jews, and how am I supposed to know, supposed to know which one is right? And so what they do is they say, I choose none and I will worship myself. They don't really say that, but that's what happens. C.S. Lewis one time, he was uh, giving a talk like this, and someone asked him, they said, what's the religion that will make me the most happy? And he said, self-worship. Next question. <laughs> <All right. laughs> but this is a real argument in the modern world. People look at the diversity of opinions about God, and they say, look, you can't solve the problem. No one can actually know the truth. You have smart people in Catholicism and smart people in Calvinism and you have smart Buddhists. And so clearly we can't figure this out. I want to read to you from Ephesians chapter 4. So Ephesians 4, St. Paul says this. And we don't take this seriously anymore. The, I hear so many Christians today, Catholic, I'm drawing my phone, Catholic and non-Catholic alike, and what they say is this, they say, you know, it doesn't really matter what kind of Christian you are. It's like going to Baskin Robbins. It doesn't really matter. One time, you know, a friend of mine, he was in a conversation like that, and uh, there were some, some new people in town that he had met, and there were five or six people talking. And this new couple who had just moved to Denver, they said, you know, we're looking for a church. How do we find a new church? And one of the other couples said, well, you know, you got to make sure that you really just connect well with the pastor and the music. And my friend is rather blunt, and he doesn't have that gift of, like, the filter. And he said, how about what's the true church? Anybody ever think about that? Conversation dead. <laughs> Everyone leaves. We don't think like that. We just, we don't want to fight. And that's a good thing. We don't want to fight with each other. I understand that. Here's what St. Paul says in Ephesians 4. He says, I beg you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling you have been, to which you have been called, with all lowliness and meekness and patience, forbearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. Here's the thing you might not have caught in that verse. Paul lists seven unities. Seven unities. 
the nature of truth is such, brothers and sisters, that the truth can't contradict itself. And as Catholics, and if you're a brother Christian here tonight, I hope, or a sister, you'll, you'll pray for this with us. But I also want to challenge you. If Protestantism is right, 15 centuries of Christians were wrong. 15 centuries. There's one faith. There is one hope. There's one church, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all and in all and through all. There is one. Fragmentation divides us. So as Christians, we have to recover unity. Sometimes when you have an enemy, it helps unite people. When I was in seminary, I was with a bunch of really impressive guys. Some of them are here tonight. They're priests now. And when you're in seminary, you look at each other and you're like kind of jealous and you do like the pecking order. And you kind of measure each other up. And you're like, wow, that guy's like, you know, he really is really smart. And that guy's a really good speaker. And you kind of get jealous of each other and you can kind of fight. When you become priests, you're just so glad that that guy's on your team. And I think something like that needs to happen today with Christians. Our world is moving against Christianity. It's moving against it. And so you and I, Catholics, Protestants, we have an obligation to strive for unity. Until we do that, our witness to the culture is not very strong. Because Christians can't even agree among themselves. So that's my challenge tonight. Uh, and I want to leave you with this. Stories matter. I wish I had more time tonight to talk about our story. People are hungry to know what the meaning of life is. They need a story. They need a place they fit in. We all want to be a part of some kind of story. One of my favorite movies as a kid was Hoosiers. And it's this great basketball movie. And I always wanted to be on the, the, the team. Even if I was little Ollie, little Ollie's this guy who can't make a basket. And the only basket he makes all year is an underhand free throw. And he makes it. I'm like, even if I could be Ollie, I just want to be on that team. We need stories. And so as Catholics and as Christians, we've got to reclaim our story. We have to tell the story about Jesus, who really is the savior of all mankind. Not one part, not another part, but all mankind. And his story is big enough for all of us. So we'll take questions in a second here, but I want you to pray with me. We're 500 years since Christianity split in half. Today, in the United States, there are 40,000 denominations of Christians in the United States. 40,000 different people who all claim to be Christians and are all divided in the United States alone. We need to pray that that ends. We need to pray for unity. We need to pray that together as lovers of Jesus Christ, as his followers, that we can have that message to the world that says Jesus really is God and there really is a truth. So let's pray for that and then we'll take questions. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Father, your Son prayed that his followers would be one even as you are one with him. Jesus, we pray for our culture we pray for our church. We pray for unity. Lord, we pray that all the wounds that Catholics have caused, that any Christians have caused, Lord, we pray for forgiveness. We pray for healing. Lord, we pray that together uh, we might truly come to you, that we might witness to your faith, hope, and love in this culture. And Jesus, we ask you for that grace through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let's take uh, questions. Awesome, great question. So, uh, he said his friend, he asked his friend if he was a Catholic, or if he was a Christian, right? He said, no, I'm not a Christian, I'm a Catholic. Uh, and if I could just comment on the names and the titles and what those mean. Um, so, in a certain sense, we can get caught up in names, you know, in those titles. But all Catholics are Christians. If you are a Catholic, you are a Christian, unless you're not really a Catholic. If you're a Catholic who's like, I don't think Jesus is God, you're not a Catholic or a Christian. <laughs> hate to break it to you. Talk to me afterwards, we'll have a beer and talk about that. 
but you can't be a Catholic and not think Jesus is God. So there's just different titles. So Catholic is a Greek word that means universal. Right? We believe that the story of Jesus was a story where he founded a church that is for everyone. It's a big enough place for everyone. Christianity you could use as a label that encompasses Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox Christians. Because um, certainly all of those people are Christians. They all follow Jesus. Uh, but we would argue, and I think, there's, I think it's actually very hard to argue against, that Jesus founded one church and that that church was the Catholic Church. So Catholics are Christians, but sometimes people use that word. They say, I'm a Christian. And sometimes when they say, I'm a Christian, they mean I'm not Catholic. They mean I'm a Protestant. But Christian encompasses both of us, Protestants and Catholics and Orthodox Christians. OK. Father, if your if the main point of your talk is to witness Christian love, or Catholic love, uh, to our secular culture, and if you're saying that Protestants, um, their one of their main issues is uh, you only have faith alone and you don't have to do good works, how then do you account for the many Protestant churches and Protestants who do a lot of <coughs> charitable works uh, if their main emphasis is simply faith alone? Right. Secondly, mm -hmm. um, if you could, it's a slightly off topic. But could you elaborate on indulgences and what role that played in the Protestant <coughs> Reformation yes. and the reaction that um, Martin Luther had to the issue of indulgences? Great. Two great questions. This is going to be way better than my talk. I love Q&A. <laughs> Those are great questions. So the first thing, yes, of course Protestants do good works. And have you ever heard of the Protestant work ethic? Protestants are famous for doing good works, and they do. They do tons of them. They do tons of them today. They have since the time of Luther. But in terms of what Protestants teach, what they believe to be true, they believe good works are a good thing, but that that cannot be what saves you. Martin Luther's battle cry was sola fide. So Romans 3.28 is a famous line that you'll often hear quoted. Romans 3.28 says, we hold that a man is saved by faith apart from works of the law. Really important line for Protestants. We as Catholics, you know, we could spend all night on this, but it's really important for us that he says, of law. Because when Paul uses the word law, nomos in Greek, he's referring to the Mosaic law. In the very next line, he says, or is God the God of Jews only? And the whole point of that is that faith is a symbol of God letting everyone into the family, the whole world. Whereas the Jews only had the law. Okay, so. We certainly know that Protestants do good works. So do atheists. Atheists do a lot of good things out there. So that's not in question. The question is, what do they teach about what it means to be a Christian? And Luther, Calvin, and their followers have all taught that to go to heaven is only about faith. We can spend more time later if you guys want on that. Second thing, indulgences. This is a great question. It hasn't come up, I don't think, this summer. <coughs> What is an indulgence? An indulgence is if I throw a rock through the school window and Miss Anderson, our principal, comes out and she says, Father Brian, you're a horrible pastor. Uh, you need to you know, ask for forgiveness. And I say, Rosemary, I'm so sorry. I really am sorry. Will you please forgive me? She says, yes. Right? Uh, that's awesome. Praise God. The problem is there's still a broken window. And somehow, we have to work to repair that window. So Catholics have always taught that, of course, we cannot fix anything apart from Christ. Jesus is the only one who can save us. John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. But we all know that we participate in that. We're called to be parts of that. So St. Augustine, and what indulgences are about are ways that we're healing the sin in our life. So when we sin, God forgives us if we go to confession and we ask for his mercy. But there's effects of that. If I've been someone who has been, um, I don't know, hateful my whole life, and I realize that's a bad thing, I go to confession, I say, God, have mercy on me. I've been a person of hate. We believe God forgives you. But those habits you've built up are still inside of you. So an indulgence has to do with healing that hatred with you not just being forgiven, but becoming the person that God desires you to be. The problem in the Reformation is that priests were selling indulgences. 
And that's a big no-no. And Luther was right about that. You can't sell that. You can't buy salvation. But that doesn't mean the concept of indulgence itself was wrong. And we could spend more time on, on biblical passages about that. But the point is, is that the abuse of something does not taint its proper use. Last thing I just want to say about that is an example of that. When I was in college, um, the Enron scandals broke. You guys remember Enron? A lot of you young adults are like, what the heck is Enron? <laughs> There's this big accounting scandal where these people misused finances and they embezzled money and they ruined a lot of people's retirement and they were accountants. And then the priest abuse scandal broke. And I was in, at CU, I was an accounting major thinking about becoming a priest. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> life is over. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, is that no one after the Enron scandals said, oh look, there was an abuse of accounting, therefore accounting is evil. No one said that. Because they knew it was an abuse. And so the abuse of indulgences doesn't mean that indulgences are false. Okay, next question. So in a postmodern world in which we live, how do we engage a culture that, that is skeptical towards this truth is right, this truth is wrong. Where, where, where truth is subjective. Where truth is subjective. Love it, great question. So here's what I think. So the early Christians, we live in a time very similar to the fall of Rome. And the early Christians didn't win over the Roman Empire by telling them that they had all kinds of moral problems. They did tell them that, by the way. They did, they, they, the early Christians were against abortion, they were against contraception, they were against all the things we're against today. But that's not what won people over. What won people over was that Christians died for what they believed and they loved and served others. That's huge. Absolutely huge. When you love someone first, it opens doors. I'll tell you one more story. So Christianity teaches, and as always taught, as Judaism has, that extramarital sex is wrong. Right? Outside of marriage, we just believe sex is wrong. One of my friends, who shall remain nameless, who's a priest, he, we all do a lot of marriage prep. And I would say, I mean, I don't know the percentage, but 80, 90% of the couples that we get are living together when they come to us. Now, he tells them in the very first meeting, if you do not move out, I will not do marriage prep with you. What do you think most of those couples do? <laughs> See ya. <laughs> and he's right. His teaching's right. I don't do that. I'm like, stay together all you want. Do whatever you want. I'm just kidding. I don't really say that. <laughs> but I don't do it in the first meeting. Because if you don't have a relationship with somebody, if you don't know them, if you don't love them, and you tell them that they're doing something wrong, every single one of us, myself included, gets defensive. We all do. And so I don't do it in the first meeting. I do it down the road. But I want them first to see that I care about them. I'm not here to make their lives hard but I actually love them and I want them to have a good marriage. And when they can have an encounter with me and they say, you know what, Father Brian seems like a normal guy. I mean, he's, he, he seems normal, he seems to care about us, he listens to what we say, that's when you can start to have that conversation. So I think similarly on a cultural level, right, Julian the Apostate, who was the first Roman emperor to leave Christianity after the empire converted, Julian the Apostate says, he complains about Christians. He says, everyone's converting to Christianity because these Christians don't only care for their own poor, they care for ours. And so I think the way forward in our time, in a modern world where people don't believe truth exists, right? Truth doesn't exist, so you can't tell people about truth. Uh, they don't believe that the world is really good, they're cynical about the good. I think what we have to do is we have to show them the beauty of love. That's why Mother Teresa, right? Mother Teresa, best evangelist ever, after Jesus and Paul. But Mother Teresa doesn't get up and give a lecture like I do. She goes and picks up lepers in the gutters of Calcutta. And all of a sudden, people's hearts are opened. So I don't know. That's, that's kind of my thought on it. Okay, next question. And John, you tell me when we should cut back on time. Hi, Father. Greetings. So, my question is, uh, is relativism inspired by and possibly the same thing as postmodernism? It's related. It's not the same thing. So postmodernism, and it's hard to define, because I don't think there's ever been a philosopher that's come out and said, I am postmodern. 
It's a movement that we give a, a label to. So like Jacques Derrida, um, Michael Foucault, the really person I think who's the author of postmodernism is Friedrich Nietzsche, although he's earlier. But essentially, right, the Enlightenment and Christians, when you have hundreds of years where people who are smart and who have good intentions, all of them, I think, when they just fight among themselves, and the Enlightenment did too, at the end of that time, you get Friedrich Nietzsche. And so Nietzsche looks at the Enlightenment and he says, all these guys tried to find a system for why we should behave a certain way and why morality is good. And at the end of that time, they all kind of failed. They disagreed among themselves. They got rid of faith and human nature. That's a whole other talk. And they tried to find another way that we should be moral people. And they couldn't do it. And so at the end of that time, Friedrich Nietzsche comes along and he says, it's all BS, which is a technical philosophical term. <laughs> and he says, it, none of it's true. It's all just somebody's, somebody wants to be powerful. And we still talk like that today. So that's postmodernism. If someone says something's true, they don't really know the truth. They're just trying to put their power on you and control you. So they're not the same thing, but they're very related. And postmodernism tends to say, there is no big story. There's no story about all of us here tonight. There is no thing that unites all of us. There's my story and each one of your individual stories. And reality's kind of a mess that doesn't have a unity. So they're related, but they're not the same. So the first question is basically, I talked about how there's a unity in Catholicism, or the, or the disunity is a problem. And so the first question is, is there really a unity to Catholicism? Is that really unified? And in history, he's right, right? There are other schisms. You have um, early heresies like Arianism or Docetism, and different Christians break off from the Catholic Church. And in 1054, you have the big split between East and West. You get the Orthodox churches. And so the first question is, is there a unity to Catholicism? And the second one is, is disunity the real problem, or is the real problem, or maybe a bigger problem, is a bigger problem corruption in the church? Question one, yes and no. Yes and no. So there are other divisions in Christianity through its history. Um, so you do have early heresies. You have Arianism. Arius is a early heresy that talks of, that believe Jesus wasn't really God. Um, you have, the biggest one is in 1054, Eastern churches split off from the Roman church. Uh, in Catholicism today, there are people who don't fully believe everything the church teaches. So there's a reality there. That's true. There's something to that. The Catholic answer to that is that the truth is always one. The truth is always one. And so the and this is actually not me. This is the church father. So St. Augustine says this. So if, if people break off uh, from, if Alaska goes into rebellion tomorrow and breaks off from the United States, are there two United States? And that the Catholic Church would say, no, there's only one United States. There are people who are related to us, who believe some similar things, but there's only one United States. Now, they don't talk about the US because it didn't exist, but that's basically the analogy they use. And the, the point they make, a lot of early church fathers say that where there is Peter, there is the church. That Christ founded a church, and where Peter is, that's where you find that church. Now, it is complex. It's not perfect. So maybe one more analogy would be good. Um, pro football today. This is a, probably not a good analogy, but pro football, right? There's controversy today. There's injuries about concussions. There's kind of controversy about that. You have the Colin Kaepernick thing. There's certain uh, frictions within pro football. Now you can, my point is that there's limits to what you can disagree about. You could disagree about a rule. You could say, you know what? The way we do overtime in the NFL is a bad rule. We're gonna do overtime a different way. That's fine. We're gonna, we think you should have, you know, 12 men on the field instead of 11. At a certain point though, somebody's gotta say, there is this thing called football, and someone has control of where that stops and where that ends. Catholics believe that Jesus Christ gave that authority to the Catholic Church. 
And that's a problem that Protestants have to face, I think, is when you have some, some Christians today believe that the Pope is the representative of Jesus Christ. Catholics do. Some Christians believe he is the Antichrist. Right? That can't be true. They can't both be true. Eastern Orthodox Christians pray to Mary all the time. A lot of Protestant Christians believe that's idolatrous. They can't both be true. So that's the first point. Um, the second question, corruption. Yes, you're right. Corruption is a big deal. And I just want to say this loud and clear. In many, many ways, the Catholic Church is responsible for the Reformation. Especially priests like me. Hopefully I'm a little better than some of those guys. Hopefully. <laughs> Lord have mercy. We have to own that. We've got to own that. But corruption, right? The, the, the comparison that's often made historically is to St. Francis of Assisi. In St. Francis' time, there was a huge corruption in the church. And Francis also wanted to fix the corruption. But he did it internally. And he did it by saying, I'm going to live a life that's holy. I'm going to do my best. And he didn't know that he would start the Franciscans and all this stuff would change. But he went about it in a different way. And the Catholic critique has been, we're brothers and sisters. We love each other. But there's one church. There was corruption. There are problems. That's always a problem. It's a problem today. We always have to be overcoming corruption. But that doesn't mean we can divide. Okay, I've gone too long. Thank you for that question. Thank you all for coming tonight. This has been so fun. This summer has been amazing. I hope um, you've learned something. I hope it's made you think a little bit more deeply about your own faith. We're going to do this every summer, different topics, but we're going to do something like this every summer.